welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Margie. I'll, I'll go ahead and kick us off. Uh, so thank you again to uh, the Dragon Boat team uh, for hosting us. I've been a big fan of the product for quite some time. Um, I'm excited today to co-teach this webinar uh, with my colleague, Garrett uh, Kelly. Um, and we're going to talk about the strategic planning process. Uh, and specifically, it's geared for startups. But certainly, if you are a later stage company, I, I promise that you'll walk away learning a few tips and tricks that you can hopefully go back to your companies and, and start to implement. So first, a little bit about us. So I'll, I'll, start, I'll share a little bit about my background. So I have been in tech in Silicon Valley for the last 22 years. I started my early career at eBay when it was an early stage startup back in 2000. And I uh, cut my teeth um, in product. So I was a product executive um, at eBay for five years, and then uh, and then VP of product at four other generally Series A startups um, at, uh, uh, and uh, a bunch of marketplace startups. So after 16 years of product leadership, I moved over into the world of venture capital, uh, first at Omidyar Network, and then at Spiro Ventures, where I was a founding partner, and started investing in tech startups. So I was starting to apply all of the product principles that I learned in my 16 years of product leadership um, into um, the investing world. Um, I, th I think it actually served me quite well. Um, and then in the fall of 2020, uh, the Swimply founders had pitched to me. Um, and for those of you who may not know about Swimply, it's essentially the Airbnb of swimming pools. So it allows uh, homeowners to rent out their pools locally and by the hour to uh, their neighbors. And it completely blew up during the pandemic. But anyways, I love the story so much that I not only wanted to invest in Swimply, but I also um, begged the founders to let me join the company. And I joined really as the, the first full-time employee of the company. Um, and uh, that's a little bit about me. I'll kick it off to Garrett to introduce himself. Hey, everybody, and thanks, huh? So my name is Garrett. I come from strat the world of strategy and operations. I spent seven years at Airbnb from 2013 to 2020. Last two years, I was the global um, head of the safety team. So that would be the service, safety service handling all, all the more challenging, difficult, urgent, um, and threatening situations anyone could face while traveling. And then after Airbnb, when the pandemic hit, I took some time off. Han and I got connected and I became the director of strategy and operations at Swimply, running the customer support and trust and safety teams. And then on the strategy side, helping with annual planning, facilitating leadership offsites, OKR goal setting across departments at the company level, road mapping, and all the things in between. And, and what we'll be talking about today. Thanks, Thanks for having Gary. me. Well, so I thought I would just start with like um, Swimply story. Um, so uh, as I mentioned in the fall of 2020, the, the founders uh, start, pitched to me as they were looking to raise their first round of institutional uh, capital, and they were able to successfully close that round. And it was a $10 million round um, after sort of uh, huge success. Um, the, the site completely took off and, and blew up um, as a result of sort of the pandemic. People were locked up at home. At home. They uh, couldn't travel, but they wanted to, to go outside and do something COVID safe. And so, but, but yet all of the public pools and beaches were closed. And so they, um, you know, started to uh, hop on swimply to rent a neighbor's pool. Uh, so we closed that $10 million round. And exactly one year later, we um, raised a, another round. And that was a $30 million round. I guess it says $40 million here, but uh, it, was, it was actually a $30 million equity round um, uh, because the following summer, we tripled bookings. So we went from about $5.5 million to close to $18 million in bookings. Um, and, you know, and the market was great, uh, great conditions. We decided well, it's a great time to raise. Let's go ahead and raise. And we were able to successfully close that round. But not all uh, startups are quite as successful. Uh, most startups fail, and they fail mostly because they run out of cash. Um, so 60% of Series A startups aren't able to raise their next round. You can sort of see that like 100% of seed stage funded startups might start out. Very uh, A very small percentage of them will get to Series A. Smaller percentage, we'll get to Series B, Series C, Series D, et cetera. And why is that? Um, well, let's see, having issues with the controls, there you go. Uh, so one is that um, they don't know what the milestones are needed from at least from VCs in order to raise the next round. So, um, so 
Uh, one sort of secret that I'll let you in on is that we struggled actually with raising our round. Um, we talked to dozens and dozens of investors and we had a lot of no's. And that was because growth was not enough. So even though we grew three times, that wasn't enough. Um, so there was a lot of feedback from VCs at the time that they wanted us to prove other things. Uh, some of the things that they wanted us to prove included um, expanding beyond pools into other ver verticals to reduce the seasonality of the business. They also wanted us to prove like healthy unit economics. They also wanted us to prove like great cohort of attention. So, um, you know, it's not that users are just using the pool once or twice, but they're coming back over and over and over again to build habit. And so we almost didn't close that round, but luckily we had one investor who believed in us wrote us a term sheet uh, to lead that next round. But had we known what the milestones were um, before we went out to raise, it would have been a lot easier. Um, and likewise, um, if you don't know what the milestones are, you probably don't have a clear path, um, not only to achieving the milestones, but also to delivering true enterprise value. So these days, and especially in these market conditions, it's not enough to just raise on growth as people, uh, VCs in particular are now looking uh, for indications that you can have a really solid business model and have um, and have uh, very, very healthy unit economics and a viable sort of defensible uh, business. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, a lot of startups, yeah, they might grow, but they might not achieve some of the other goals needed to raise the next round. And then finally, poor mitigation of risks. And this did come up in some of the conversations. You know, so there were some concerns um, with um, insurance or trust and safety or regulatory shutdowns. Um, and, uh, and those were all sort of concerns that uh, investors had um, before they would be willing to write the check into us. So it gets me sort of to the main reason why we're here is that um, Garrett and I uh, posit that all startups, no matter what stage you are, seed, series A, series B, uh, uh, and beyond, you need a strategy. And Garrett, I'm going to like make this a little bit interactive. I'm going to ask the audience to uh, just type into the chat why you think startups might need a strategy based on sort of everything I, I just shared. So give folks like 20, 30 seconds, go ahead and type into the chat why you think startups might need a strategy. And then as the answers roll in, Garrett, if you can just read off like two or three of the responses. Don't be shy. There's probably not a wrong answer here. So we have strategy sets the direction. Mm -hmm. We have um, knowing where to focus efforts or resources. I would love that. Alignment across stakeholders. I love that. You guys got it. Okay, so this is sort of... Uh, Yep. An articulation of what you guys all came up with, which is um, achieving sort of outcomes. Um, alignment is really, really critical. So if folks don't know where um, we're going as a company, uh, they probably won't be able to uh, figure out it on their own. And you'll have sort of teams with misalignment and sort of, you know, uh, making assumptions around their own sort of strategies and plans. So uh, alignment is, is um, really critical. Um, and then somebody mentioned this, helps you stay focused and say no. Uh, I think that's really um, important. It's probably one of the things that I love most about strategy is because you know then what to prioritize and what to say no to. Because as you know, and especially for us product leaders, right? Like everybody will have requests. Marketing will have their requests. Sales will have their requests. Biz dev will have their requests. How do you figure out which ones to say yes to and which ones to say no to? Well, strategy will help with that. And then finally, and, and this speaks to my heart, strategy is inspirational and motivational, right? So teams are there um, and the folks that who are working with you are working and it's more than just a job for them, right? So they probably join your company because they're connected to the mission, but what's gonna um, get them to bound out of bed every day? It's that they have a very, very clear direction of where the company is going and they know how they themselves are contributing to that sort of overarching strategy. And then sort of closing with sort of a quote from Steve Jobs, one of my favorites, uh, and back to sort of focus. Focus, it means saying no to hundreds of good ideas that are out there. You have to pick carefully. And I'm actually as proud of the things that we haven't done as the things that we've done. And that's what strategy is all about. 
Okay, and so what is strategy? Um, so Garrett, I'm gonna ask uh, you to read out some responses and so I'll throw this back to the audience. Um, so if, uh, if you can take a stab of what you think strategy is and uh, go ahead and type in your response into the chat and Garrett will read some off. Anything there, Garrett? So far we have focus from Vishal. Okay. The All plan right, well, to achieve I'm... an outcome and a plan yeah. of action. Okay. So planning Excellent. around outcomes uh, to help you take action. Excellent. Love that. Okay. So yes. Um, so one, um, it's it's outcome driven. It's sort of the end state, but it's really um, it's really about sort of defining how we will win in the marketplace. Um, and then, of course, uh, we're all product leaders here, and so it's also about sort of what, you know, what value are you creating for customers, right? So what what are their needs, what are their pain points, and how will your product or service uniquely um, deliver value to them? And then, as I mentioned before, it's not enough just to have an amazing product. You also have to have uh, an enduring, viable business model, and you have to know how to create an uh, enterprise uh, value and figure out path to profitability, path to network effects, a path to a defensible moat. Um, and then uh, folks in the chat did mention, uh, it's also about outlining the plan for how you will make this into a reality. Okay, so crafting strategy. So uh, so what? how do you craft a strategy? So these are the elements of a strategy. First, it starts with mission, which is what are we trying to achieve? And then it, um, uh, it also includes vision. So what does the world look like after we've achieved it? And I'm going to go through these fast and share some examples with you. So value proposition, what unique benefits will your product or service offer to your customers? Differentiation, how will we distinguish ourselves in the marketplace? And then finally, strategy, what is our path to winning? So all of these elements sort of go into crafting a great strategy. And so to bring it to life, I thought I would share sort of the swiftly example that sort of I worked on um, in the first year um, with the founders. And then as Garrett came on, he worked with the founders and the executive teams to help sort of define this. So Swimbley's mission, and as I mentioned before, missions should be inspirational. So it's to bring local communities together through joy and play. So you can sort of see this as sort of being like that sort of five, 10 year mission of um, something that's really inspirational that we wanna bring about into the world. And then um, our vision is that we would do this, you know, uh, uh, achieve the mission by creating a world where everyone has access to the space that they need to pursue their passions and build connection. The value proposition was uh, that we were going to build a marketplace where homeowners could rent out their unique spaces to neighbors locally and by the hour. And the differentiation for us was that these experiences would be private, you know, so if you were to go to a public pool or to the beach, that's not a private experience. Our experience is private. You can, unlike um, Airbnb, you could rent these um, spaces by the hour instead of having to rent it overnight. Um, the experience should be joyful, but it also should be a trusted and safe marketplace. And we were going to start with pools. Um, so uh, before we decided to expand into other spaces, we decided we were really going to start with pools and win in pools. And so our strategy um, and, or strategic pillars was that we were going to first start by creating the market around pools because nobody had ever done this before. And we would help to normalize it um, because especially if anybody um, remembers uh, Swimbly in the first year or two, it was weird, right? And maybe it's still weird to like go into a stranger's backyard and just use their pool. So we really wanted to normalize it. Um, but we also wanted to lead on trust and safety and regulatory. And that was uh, one of the reasons why we brought Garrett in to Swimply as his seven years of Airbnb experience was exactly um, relevant and super, super helpful for us as we look to build out a trusted marketplace. And then finally, um, category expansion. So beyond pools, and you know, this was some of the feedback from the VCs so that they wanted us to reduce the seasonality of the business, but then also look to prove out other verticals. Um, and so... Um, so our next foray is into sports court, sports courts. Okay, so your turn. Um, and so I thought that it would be fun for all of you to try out what Tesla's um, strategy might be, starting with mission, vision, value prop, et cetera. So um, does anybody, can anybody take a stab? Would you know maybe um, what Tesla's mission is? 
So Garrett, if you see any responses, love to have you read it out. And I thought I'd start with a really well-known example. So this shouldn't be hard for most of us. We have from Jennifer to build the best EV cars in the world, accelerate okay. the transition to electric vehicles from Stephanie. And then from Saket, the mission, create long-term movability solutions, keeping environment in mind. Okay, those are those are great. Those are excellent um, stabs at it. So I'll I'll take I'll I'll do mission, vision, and value prop all at once. So um so uh, Tesla's mission statement and they changed in 2016, but this is what it's currently on their website is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. So again, so it's like a 10 year vision. It's super inspirational, right? And um they they're not actually telling us through the mission how they're going to go about it, but it's sort of what's the, sort of what do they want to bring into the world? Um, and so the vision is to create the world's most compelling car company. Um, that's how they were going to sort of achieve their mission. And then the value prop, and a lot of you um, sort of also mentioned this, was that they wanted to start with building best-in-class electric vehicles um, that were sort of very beautiful, design-oriented, high-performance, obviously greener, energy-efficient, long-range batteries, so that was what um, was their value prop. Um, and then sort of differentiation and strategy. Anybody want to take a stab at that? Well, make I took EVs a stab cool. At this. I like What's that. that? <laughs> make EVs cool. Make EVs cool, make yeah. It, so make it I took accessible. a stab at this. Um, I, I didn't pull it from the website or anywhere. Um, so I could be right or I could be wrong, but this was my stab at what I think Tesla's differentiation is and what their strategy is. So I think some of the differentiation, you know, when you look at sort of the world of, you know, non-EV cars or even EV cars is um, sort of long lasting battery, sort of software, software is huge um, piece of sort of what makes Tesla different, um, vertical integration. So they own, you know, sort of uh, the plants that make all the parts and the batteries, um, uh, the charging stations. Uh, they also wanted to focus on sort of direct distribution. So they're not selling through dealerships, they're selling their own cars in retail and online. And they wanted to build a love mark brand. So the strategy, and again, this was my stab at the strategy, is first, we're going to start by creating uh, the market for electric um, vehicles. Uh, so we're going to start with a beautiful uh, sports car that had fast acceleration. Um, but over time, we're going to sort of build out and build a more affordable car and then use that money to build an even more affordable car. And then uh, the second part of the strategy of, and again, this is my stab at it, is lead with vertical integration. Um, and then third was to own the distribution channels. So anyways, it was kind of fun for me to last night kind of take a stab at Tesla's. But you should, um, you know, for your companies, try to take a stab at this, right? Like either on your own or kind of pull in a team, take a stab at like mission, vision, value prop, di differentiation and strategy. Um, and, you know, and uh, uh, one one thing that we love and Gary and I do a lot of facilitation of this is uh, strategic planning or um, annual sort of uh, leadership offsite. So uh, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Garrett. I'm going to uh, stop the screen share so that you can share your screen, Garrett. Okay. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yep. Excellent. So thank you, Ha. I appreciate that. So Ha talked a lot about mission, vision, and strategy, why it's important, with some examples of how companies have done it pretty well and pretty clearly. What I'm here to tell you is that's not enough. You could have the best strategy in the world, but without the right goals and targets and roadmaps and operational rigor and discipline and employee behaviors and, and institutionalized habits around operating and achieving that strategy over time, it'll just fall flat. And so there's more to it than just strategy, that's just stage one. So I'm gonna talk about goal setting. I'm gonna use the OKR framework because we find it's pretty clear and helpful. Um, and it's been, I've seen it work in action at multiple companies and seen it done well. So that's how we're gonna measure success. And then separate from that, one level down is road mapping. How will we get there? What are those individual tasks or initiatives that help us achieve those goals we've set which help us achieve the strategy, which help us achieve the mission and vision over time. So goal setting. The O stands for objectives, the goals that inspire and set direction. We'll give some examples on the next slide of what this looks like, but where do we need to go? Then you have the key results, the specific measures and targets of how we'll achieve those objectives. And initiatives is separate from the OKR framework. OKRs really focus on the first two, but 
when I would work with teams a lot on implementing the framework, I would find almost every time people would initially put initiatives in as key results or objectives. Um, we'll give some examples now on how to, how to properly split these out. So for Swimply, we've I'll go through four objectives and key results here. First one, build a happy and productive team. So because it's such a seasonal business, we wanna make sure we, we have a hiring sprint in the spring as summer in the United States and Canada is where we see 80, 90% of our business for the year. Um, and for them to be happy, we need to be measuring their satisfaction levels. So we wanna hit a very high mark. So how are we gonna hit 90% employee satisfaction? We need values alignment. So we're gonna roll out core values and we're gonna hire and performance manage across those values to make sure we're encouraging the right behaviors. Um, if we achieve that values alignment well, they should be fairly satisfied. We wanna recognize them and celebrate wins when they're doing great work. And then when we performance manage, we're driving clarity of what success looks like in their roles. We're coaching them for growth and helping them develop their skills, which we believe also will in turn affect the key results of employee satisfaction. And if we do that well, we'll achieve the objective of happy and productive team. So for two, grow the market for pools. We need to focus on our core business. We need to increase the number of supply that we have, which will, we believe will fuel demand. We need to increase the number of bookings we have. And we wanna make sure that if of the users, guests and hosts that but guests particularly for this metric that use us, are they coming back and using us again? And that's an indicator of sustainable growth over time. So how are we going to achieve these metrics? We're gonna do billboards and use social and influencers because we're such an experiential brand around joy and play, having big billboards where people are playing in a pool and having fun in the summer and the sun, we think will drive the engagement and people to sign up and give it a try. Going to three, build healthy and trusted build a healthy and trusted marketplace. Coming from Airbnb, trust and safety was so critical um, to the growth of the company. A lot of times when people were hesitant or resistant to hosting or trying it as a guest is they didn't trust it, they didn't feel safe doing it. And so this goes across all shareholders. It's guests, do I trust that the experience will be what I expect? It's hosts, can I trust that I won't have a liability concern or issue on my hand should something go wrong or someone be injured? For cities and regulators, is this going to be a neighborhood disturbance and create a problem for our communities and should be regulated or kick it out? Or do we trust that it's a safe experience that provides a value add to the health and satisfaction of our communities? So the initiatives that we want to prioritize on our roadmap and invest in, we want really responsive and well-trained CS and TNS teams. Part of the responsive component is unlike Airbnb, which is a, a, while you're traveling, people usually book that in advance and they have a lot of time between when they search, book, when they check in, check out. At Swimply, we would see very often, I sign up, I book a pool for same day, I have a check-in within an hour. But with a new product and new service and new experience, it comes with a lot of questions. So even more than at Airbnb when we were running CS and TNS teams, we at Swimply had to be incredibly responsive and in the moments we were investing in things like chat. So you could be on the app, you booked it, now you have a quick question, we're there right there in the moment to respond to you. That helps build a sense of trust that this experience is going to be worthwhile. Um, for hosts, the securing the $1 million host insurance is critical. Not only is it a differentiator for us for potential competitors by getting into that market and making sure our hosts are covered, that's going to pull the supply over to our um, platform, but it's also going to give hosts that sense of peace of mind that it's okay to sign up. We have your back up to a million dollars. So expanding beyond pools. Um, yes, we want to focus on the core business always, but the core business is incredibly seasonal. So as Ha mentioned earlier, investors are sort of looking to how are we mitigating risk and growing the business in a healthy way that isn't just a few months out of the year. So we wanna go into tennis courts and sports courts. Uh, we, we identified that as a, a growing sport, especially pickleball, which some of you might not have heard of, but it was the fastest growing sport through the pandemic uh, in, the, in the United States. So we wanna help secure that uh, on board those courts um, and then increase the amount of bookings we see per, per supply. And on the right, there's also initiatives around, besides the tennis partnerships, productizing lessons. So what we learned is that you have a host and a guest like Airbnb, but we also have service providers. So those that want to teach swimming lessons and then they, they want to book a pool and they want to bring the guests in, um, which would be their class that they then teach. So how do we productize this new demographic or um, customer type into the product? And so even though that's it's not necessarily expanding beyond pools, but it's expanding beyond the actual core business we started with in unique ways. 
Hey, Garrett, before you move off that slide, we had a question specific to one of the key results from yeah. Kate. She asked, how did you choose 40% repeat users as one of the key results? I'll let Ha speak to that one, actually. Yeah, um, so with uh, if you've ever measured cohorts, and it kind of depends on the product, right? So like a social network, um, you know, the user repeat uh, would be higher than, say, an e-commerce site. Uh, but, um, you know, for marketplaces, uh, you, you generally sort of see a, a large number of people sort of book once and then never book again. But um, being sort of in venture capital, sort of, you know, I know that, like, if you can get almost 50 percent of your users to come back, um, uh, then those numbers are really, really solid. So um, for many of you to kind of come up with the number. I would ask around. Um, so for example, I might do some research. If you're working on a, um, a marketplace company, uh, you might wanna talk to some of your marketplace peers around what they're seeing in terms of repeat. Um, founders would probably end up talking to a lot of uh, VCs, especially growth VCs who are looking to invest in the next round to sort of see um, what they're expecting. So a little bit of, of it is calibration and a little bit of it is kind of where you are now. So at the time we were, at 25% repeat. So we thought that we could actually get it, you know, sort of with some effort um, closer to 35 or 40%, so. Yeah, and with, with a lot of goals, a lot of times it comes down to like, where are we at today? And we baseline it, and then we just seek incremental improvement over time. So to Ha's point, we knew we were at 25, so we're gonna try to incrementally improve and have a stretch goal of additional 15% over the next year. Um, and then as she was saying, if you, if you want to show good growth, you could always just move into new markets. Like we were based in the United States, Canada, and we we're starting to go into Australia. And that shows growth to new markets, but what is an indicator of how well those markets will do over time? And that's where you've already moved into, how loyal are your customers and how often are they repeating it? And that can be a leading indicator if you go into a new market, will those patterns also be there? So now we can forecast that growth a year or two in advance because we expect it to follow suit as, a, as the growth we saw in loyalty metrics we saw in the countries we're already in. Great question. There we go. Okay. So going into road mapping, um, this is what you, is gonna help you prioritize the resources and tasks that bring your strategy to life and help you achieve your goals. So we put together uh, this little chart. Um, you have on the Y axis, the business impact. What do we, how, to what degree do we expect this initiative or task to impact the business? And on the X axis, what is the complexity to deliver that? So a lot of times in product engineering teams, you'll define complexity and the time it'll take an engineering team to, to build this tool or feature. And so like really high complexity might be greater than six weeks of engineering team's time. Low complexity might be we could achieve this in a, a couple of days or middle complexity could be we could get this done within a two week sprint. But the four categories we have here are high impact, low complexity. A lot of times you'll hear the phrase low hanging fruit. Um, these are easy wins. They're going to make it on your roadmap every time, or they should rather. Then you have high impact, high complexity. These are usually the strategic initiative, initiatives that do take a lot of time, but are identified as foundational pieces that will help you scale with the business or then achieve these quick wins much easier once this strategic foundational um, thing is built. Then you have low impact, low complexity. Um, so if it's low impact, low complexity, these are like things we could quickly build and they might meet, like have some value add, but not a ton. So I put pursue or revisit here to say like, can we bundle a lot of these low impact, low complexity things together? Um, or can we reframe or repackage it in a way where we can drive the impact up? Um, but either way, these, these are definitely things that are kind of teetering on, do they make it or not on the roadmap? And this totally depends on the resources you have and, and all of the different um, initiatives you've identified. Then you have low impact, high complexity. Don't waste your time, deprioritize these. If they're not gonna make an impact, they're gonna take a lot of resources, save them for a future date. And so we have strategy, we've now built our roadmap. We have an idea of the goals we wanna achieve because they'll inform the, the, um, the outcomes, the mission and the vision. And then we have the tasks. Now we need to build, I call it institutionalizing habits around operational rigor. So there's a certain cadence um, where annually you'll, you'll sort of have a certain focus, monthly, weekly, um, it'll be different. So annually, you should be 
you should be doing an offsite annually with the leadership team to identify the resource allocation for the year and the overall annual plan. What are those big strategic bets you're going to make? And what are those OKRs you want to achieve for that year? This can be around a company retreat. Um, we've seen it done different ways, but generally an offsite's best. Change of pace, change of place equals change of perspective. You get the leader team, ship, leadership team together um, offsite in a different environment. And we find that's the best environment to come up with great ideas and be creative and, and align that team around your goals for the year. Quarterly, you want to adjust these OKRs quarterly. So you have your annual plan, but you should be checking in quarterly on those goals. Are these the right goals? Are these the right metrics that we're tracking? Um, are we doing really well? Okay, we should stretch that goal out a little more. Are we not even close to hitting it? Okay, we should maybe reset expectations. Monthly, how are you connecting your employees to the strategy and the targets? We've seen this done best through all hands. How are you tracking progress within your individual de departments or programs, monthly business reviews? So they come and present on how well they're doing, how well they're tracking towards those targets, and then you get to ask the questions. Do you need more resources if you're not hitting it? Okay, you're hitting it, you're ahead of pace. Can we borrow some of those resources and reallocate it over to this goal that's struggling? Um, and then employees pull surveys, kind of gauging how everyone's doing. Do we feel like we're on the right track? And hearing from your stakeholders within the company. And then weekly. Weekly is sort of that cadence for project management and roadmap review. This is where your project management or program manager will come in and with the project team and say, how are we on this task? This was due last week. Did, did it get accomplished? If not, why? What do you need in order to get it done? And what's your new due date? And that's sort of the building that muscle and habit on a weekly basis. So that when you're presenting monthly to you know, department leaders and executive stakeholders, you're able to speak to it clearly and they're able to hold you, you're able to hold each other accountable, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so the last thing I wanna leave everybody with is you could have the best strategy in the world. You could even have an incredible operational discipline and rigor and habit, but who's at the center of all of this? People, you hire people, you train people, you onboard them, you performance manage them. What do people need in order to deliver their best work? So at the strategic level, these are some of the people programs you'll, you've probably heard of or you see, and I, we recommend investing in. Performance management, core values, recognition programs, learning and development, diversity and equity and inclusion, structure, clarity, ERGs. And what are the behaviors that we see these translate into? And this is the behaviors you'll see in that operating cadence we talked about. Productivity, engagement, motivation, sustainability, accountability, belonging, diversity, innovation, retention, et cetera. And people, again, are at the center of all of this. So they're the ones that's going to be building all these tasks and delivering these initiatives. They're going to be the ones that bring your strategy to life at the end of the day. So we let's not forget them. Thank you. And this is how, if you would like to, to get in touch with us. But that does bring us to a close of the presentation from Han I. We thank you for allowing us to speak uh, with you, Dragon Boat, and for everyone joining. We appreciate your time. Well, one more, one more slide, Garrett, which is being a product leader, I, I don't go and, um, ever without collecting feedback. So this is a very short three-question survey, the Net Promoter Score survey of what, what you thought of our webinar and what you liked about it and what could be improved about, about it. Um, it's the very first time we've ever given this webinar, so we would love, 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 love to get uh, your feedback on it, um, good and bad. Um, so best way to actually do it is um, pick up your phone and point it to the QR code and then click on the link and it'll just take you to that three question survey. Um, and then uh, uh, there's also sort of a fourth optional question, which you can leave uh, off if you um, aren't interested, but uh, Garrett and I love doing this stuff. We, you know, we worked with um, the Swimply founders and the executive team on sort of strategy and planning, but um, if you want to sort of have a schedule a 30 minute chat with us to help us assess your situation, love to chat with you. So just uh, leave us your email address and we can be back in touch. And, and as we transition over um, to Dragon Boat to speak more, I did forget to mention and do want to mention when we had a demo of the tool and we got to see it, like at Swimply, we were doing this all out of spreadsheets and trying to connect the dots and trying different tools to connect the goals to the roadmaps and and to like track progress and it, we just couldn't do it well. Every time we had quarter quarterly review of those OKRs, it was sort of like we were scrambling just to say, did we hit it or not at each quarter time, which you'll see a lot in organizations, that operational rigor and tracking progress over time is extremely difficult and great tools make that so much easier. And so when we were getting a walk through the demo of Dragon Boat, I'm sitting here going, oh, I wish I had this. <laughs> 
So, As you're walking um, through your slides, I'm sitting there going, oh, that could plug perfectly into the Dragon Boat hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Okay, we have a lot of questions and we saved some time at the end. So I can just jump in and start asking questions. And for those still on, we'd love to hear from you as well. So please submit your questions through the Q&A and then we'll, we'll try to get to everything today. So the first question we got early in the presentation is, do investors evaluate company culture? That's from Susie. Okay, I'll take that one being a former VC. Um, I wish they did. <laughs> so I wish more of them did. Um, I would say that that's probably not the top priority, um, but I do know with the last raise, uh, the Mayfield was our lead investor, um, and uh, we got all of the executives got interviewed by the operating partner, and a lot of his questions were trying to understand sort of you know uh, what values we had in place, and then just also more about each of us as executives beyond just our functional expertise. So. Some of the questions which I had never heard before, but I really liked it was like, which 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 of the executives slash founders was is the inspirational one? Which of the executives or founders like lead culture? Which of the executives and founders, um, you know, are uh, are the problem solvers? And I had never, you know, in, in VC asked any of those questions, and I it was rare for me to see um, VCs asking, and I think they all should because it tells you a lot about um, you know whether these startups, like the maturity level, and uh, and then also openness and willing willingness to learn. And then we got a lot of questions during that OKR slide. I think people are really digging into how to kind of differentiate between objectives, key results, and initiatives. So we'll just kind of jump into that. How do you evaluate initiatives against each other? And how do we know there is more value investing in regulatory playbook, for instance, versus an initiative that not, did not make the cut? I can take this one. Um, this is, it's very challenging to do this well. And that's why we like the OKR framework is it allows you to really hone your focus into just a few objectives and then a few key results for those objectives. And then you're kind of top down from there thinking of what are the initiatives that impact those. Now, if you're thinking regulatory versus something else, a lot of that comes down to what are the resources you have in house and what is their expertise. So if Ha hires me as head of trust and safety um, and CS and insurance, part of my job is to help work with our legal team to create the regulatory playbook. And so if we know regulatory, for instance, is an existential threat to our business, if we get regulated out of cities, that's something we can never look past and deprioritize. So we have to find a way to put that in the roadmap and resource it. If we don't have resources, we better find them. Um, but if it's against something else, there could be another team that owns that. And that's okay because then we have different resources, in different places tackling different problems. But if it's within the same department, if I need to focus on regulatory and insurance and then a policy on mutism, for example, I'm probably gonna lean towards the regulatory playbook and insurance for now and we'll get to the other poly community policies at a later date. And then the last part I'll say there is it goes back to that graph I had on one of the slides. What is our perceived level of impact versus our perceived level of complexity? And that can help frame that conversation as well um, and help us establish what the right trade-offs are. You must have had some fun conversations. Working in safety at Airbnb for seven years, we would have meetings at the uh, headquarters in San Francisco and people would walk by and peek their head in and say, what do you do here? Because we're talking about all the different threats, risks, harm, the ways people could abuse each other in person or online. And then, yeah, having those policy discussions was pretty wild sometimes. So on the same topic of OKRs, where do functional level strategies such as product, HR, marketing come in, or are they not necessary in a startup and splitting the initiatives by function is sufficient at a startup stage? Is that question about splitting the like OKRs and having those at like a department level, or is it about, um, or is it not goal specific? Is that... Jing, do you want to provide an additional clarity in the chat? Um, I, actually, I think I, I think I understand it. Um, I, I would call that there's a corporate strategy. That's the mission and vision and strategy. And then I think at the department level, that's like the OKR portion of the strategy comes in. And it's about how are you as a department setting goals that funnel up into the company goals to some degree and help the company achieve its strategy. 
Um, and so what we did at Swimply and what I saw at Airbnb is each department would have their own OKRs, but they should ladder. And so when you look at the company and executives should come out for their annual planning with company level OKRs to set the path for the year. And then from that, the departments then put their heads together, department leaders with their teams and come up with what's their goals, measurable targets, and then roadmaps for their next quarter that will help them help that department incrementally let the company achieve its goals. Okay, and then since early startups generally move quickly and gain information over time and constant re constantly readjust, can you touch on how you build these OKRs over time? Which did you have in the first six months and what did you add by 12 months that were the triggers for the update? Ha, do you want to take this one? You're simply for the two uh, years who <laughs> saw it very early well, as yeah, employee you know, number one. Um, I would say that like it evolves over time, you know, so in the beginning we were um, pretty loosey goosey with OKRs, you know, um, and uh, it was, uh, so we, we sort of did it, um, we did annual and then we did quarterly, but then we weren't sort of going back and sort of tracking um, how we did against the quarterly before like coming up with new goals the next quarter. And so Garrett, when, um, you know, when you came on and I knew that like you, um, had done okay, okay as well at at uh, Airbnb. That was sort of when we got a little bit more disciplined and and rigorous with um, you know really like not just the annual um, goal setting, but then the quarterly goal setting and sort of the discipline of looking back um, and sort of seeing how we did. So, um, but it evolves. You know, you'll 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 kind of start with where you can feel comfortable and then evolve in and get like um, more rigorous uh, over time. Okay, and then last question on the OKR side from Landon, um, specific to number two and four, but I think just more generally is, did you consider having revenue and ARR targets? And if so, can you explain why you went in a different direction? Yeah, of course, we we definitely had uh, revenue targets. Um, so we were a marketplace, so we had um, gross bookings volume targets and then net revenue targets. Uh, but um, as I kind of mentioned at the very, very start of the presentation, we thought at least in, you know, in um, our last fundraise that revenue was enough, you know, so as long as we could triple revenue, you know, tri triple gross bookings volume and triple revenue, that we would have no problem raising the round. And it didn't turn out to be the case because revenue um, is necessary, but insufficient, um, in terms of like what the VCs are looking for. And so that is why it's really, really important to understand those goals, those milestones based on feedback from VCs, from the marketplace, um, other founders, other product leaders, and help you sort of set those milestones, um, which would then kind of ladder to everything else that we talked about, sort of strategies and OKRs and initiatives and roadmaps and so. And then switching gears a little, ha, this was asked earlier on in the, in the conversation. Um, how did Swimply normalize an experience that was out of the ordinary? Oh, <laughs> that's a fun one. <laughs> Mostly it was through word of mouth. Um, so the great thing was we had net promoter scores that were out of this world. I mean, I'd never seen NPS scores in the 70s and even 80s, which really meant that like, and, and, and you read all the qualitative from customers, which was, Oh my gosh, it was weird at first, but then after a while, you know, like it was magical, you know, like I'd never experienced something that was like, felt like my own. Like I felt like it was my own pool and I was enjoying it with family and friends. And, you know, there was laughter and joy and smiles. And, and so um, when you have a product that is as loved as Swimply was, it naturally lent itself to sharing, right? Word of mouth, telling, telling a friend, telling a neighbor, telling a work colleague, telling, um, your uh, kindergartner's parents uh, after school drop off about Swimbly. So that was kind of how we grew. Um, and then social was very big for us because it was very Instagrammable. So we went there and you would first do uh, Instagram in the first year and then the second year was all TikTok, TikTok videos. No nudism though, to Garrett's point. Oh, well, <laughs> we had some of that too. That's the, that, that's the, um, the beauty of it being private is like we saw all sorts of communities flock to um, swim place or nudist colonies, mermaid communities, <laughs> that, uh, you know, folks that might have um, had disabilities, 
you know, um, or like religious um, groups who like, you know, uh, maybe due to their religion, uh, didn't want to sort of show skin in public. So it's really fun, wasn't it for Gary? It was really fun. Lots of fun use cases. Yeah. It's fun for me having most of my career in trust and safety space is I get to be the guy that comes in and, and tell you all the weird things that are probably happening on your platform that you didn't know about and, and plan for it. So that's where the policy development comes in where you get to have those nudist colony talks. But. Um, hi, you mentioned NPS being through the roof. That that leads to another question by Saket around um, NPS specifically. So isn't that a lagging KPI and should you choose other KPIs than NPS? Yeah, um, for sure. Like so, uh, net, um, so I started uh, several startups ago, always measuring NPS, Net Promoter Score, which basically gives you a score from negative 100 to 100. The question for those who might not know is, um, would you recommend this product or service to a friend or colleague? And then, uh, based on the responses, you get a score from negative 100 to 100. I started measuring it several startups ago, like monthly, and that was like a um, a way for us to measure whether whether we were getting better for our customers or worse for our customers. So I highly recommend that it is one of your dashboard metric. It, of course, it can't be the only one. And I think in Garrett's uh, OKR slide, I think he did a nice job showing that um, NPS was just one of few different sort of um, KPIs that we track um, for customer service. It was CSAT, you know, so customer satisfaction. But other groups might have their own uh, metrics that they yeah. evaluate themselves on. And and it also is like department based. So if you're running customer teams, you know, how your customers feel about the service you're providing or their experience should definitely be something you're, you're paying attention to. And it doesn't need to be a zero sum game or because you're um, measuring that you're not measuring something else. You can do both. And I think too, for the business, while it is definitely a lagging indicator in many ways, it also is a leading indicator to say how many of these customers will repeat or refer others and feel organic growth. And so it is sort of an indicator of, of different areas of the business that we're focusing on. So it's primarily focused on how do our customers feel about us and how well, of, how good of a job are we doing? But it also, and it's a lagging indicator, and not, lagging indicator in that way, but it could also be a leading indicator in other ways of the business too. And then Jing um, contributed to the chat in response to your answer to her question earlier, Garrett, around the functional OKR. So just to clarify, um, it sounds like strategy and objectives are set at the corporate level, and then the department functions would set KRs and initiatives. Is that yes. right? Yeah. They can still set objectives as well. Like if an objective of the company is to become data-driven, and that's the objective, then um, an objective at the department level could be to um, purchase this tool or to high, like um, visualize that like metrics and dashboards at some base foundational level. And then the key results for that could be like how many dashboards or how many hires do you need? And you can get into the more measurable specifics there. So, um, but that is a good way to, to frame it as well, yeah. Okay, and then the last question we have right now is from Shama. What it was your North Star metric at Swimply? Oh, Shama, <laughs> she, she and I know each other. Um, uh, <laughs> I don't know, Garrett, I don't, I don't think we had one North Star metric. I mean, I, if it was anything, it was definitely GBV. Um, but I, yeah, but again- like, It changes, it changes over time. Yeah, I'd say. I would say that like uh, GBV at least uh, was just, not sufficient enough. Um, uh, I would say that if I were to pick a North Star metric now for Swimply, um, it would be around retention. Um, you know, uh, so and, and you know, retention also leads to GBV. But that was really, I think, the biggest feedback from uh, VC investors was repeat. That, yeah, you know, they didn't want us to keep pouring money on, at the top of the funnel to then have a leaky bucket and have users never come back. It just brings up your CACs, cost of customer acquisition. You know, you have like lower um, LTVs, uh, lifetime values. And so there was definitely a focus on um, retention, repeat. Um, and so we um, we ended up hiring like a lifecycle marketer to really focus on sort of how, how do we bring customers back through the funnel. Um, so and to add to that, like, I think retention was, you could call it maybe a North Star metric, but then there's still like fires of the week, right? Like we're realizing as guests or hosts were signing up, they're just matching the market price. 
but their pools aren't as high of quality. So we were having a problem where the price dynamics of the marketplace were skewing too high. And so when we want good retention, we realized this big, this kind of big problem we had was we need to have more product differentiation. So different types of pools have the appropriate pricing for the, for the experience or the space uh, that you're gonna have. And by doing that, we're gonna drive more attention because people are gonna book more if the price is lower or at least matches the sense of experience that they're gonna get. And so for a while, it's like, we need to get price down, we need to get price down. So it felt like a North Star, but really it was only so we could achieve that North Star of retention. And so that's sort of that strategic thinking and strategic framework that OKRs help with is instead of just fighting fires week in and week out to the new thing that you know you wanna throw your resources toward, it helps you maintain that sense of this is why we're fighting this fire to keep our keep our sights on this um, North Star metric or this overall strategy, this overall mission. Wonderful. Well, I'm so, so glad to have you both join us. We got some great questions, really good audience engagement, really good feedback. Thanking you both for an incredible and high value session. So thanks for bringing your wisdom to the conversation for the CPO series. For everybody here, I will be sharing the slides. I'll be sharing the recordings. And if there were any questions we didn't get to, we'll um, please reach out to Ha or Garrett on LinkedIn. And then we'll also share their contact info in our follow-up email. Just a couple quick things before we drop off. We do have two more sessions in the fall CPO series. So November 30th, we're bringing Tammy Reese in to talk about managing your product and team managing your work and team like a product. And then we have Denise Tills, who's talking about why product operations is CPO's secret weapon. And then finally, um, just come check out Dragon Boat. We do OKR and road mapping. So a lot of what Garrett talked through, we can help add the framework for, so you can move off of spreadsheets and have a central source of truth. So Garrett, Ha, thank you so much for joining. Everybody who tuned in today, great to see you all. And we will be in touch.